<laughs> okay. Uh, I believe... I believe this means we are live. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, tech fans of all shapes and sorts and sizes and persuasion, sometimes you just got to turn it off and on again. Welcome to another episode of the Monday Morning Tech Chat Show on the SGGQA podcast channel. I am Juan Carlos Bagnell, aka Some Gadget Guy, the SGG of this terribly named podcast series. And, and of course, uh, what we really care about is the QA part of this conversation, the question and answer, making this an interactive conversation as we talk about the news. And uh, I, I, I love it when um, I love it when, you know, you're going live and nothing is working the way that it should be. So I'm fresh off a reboot. Uh, my Internet connection still looking pretty shaky, but I've got yellow green signal as opposed to red. So uh, we should be able to uh, to muscle through, but we're going to try and power through. We're going to try and keep this going. We're going to try and keep it alive. And uh, yeah, yeah, it's always fun. So I hope everyone out there had a phenomenal weekend. I hope you had some some lovely time, uh, you know, catching up with family, with friends, getting to unplug for a bit and then doing fun things with your tech as opposed to always just talking about the tech. But I'm already seeing a great lineup in this live chat right now. Uh, let's see, we've got Root Knight, Heiki, Aditya Anil, McCorcoran, Dank Pickman, uh, Gary the Fireman. Hey, what's up, Gary? Dave Burns, Steve, Q3 Becker, Gabaletta, Awesome Possum, uh, Gorm Lord, Ranesh, JMX Warrior, Simon Says Hypno, uh, Tech Love and Mama. Everyone says hey! <laughs> Nick Fell. Thank you for, for sticking. Raymond, thank you for uh, for sticking with. Um, no, I really did. I really did just throw in the last two minutes of my my little intro there. I threw the whole computer through a reboot, and I seem to be getting better connection speeds now. It's it's always the uh, it's always the funness of uh, trying to trying to get this stuff up and running, and and you know I, I'm duct taping all, this entire setup together to try and make every week happen. It's it's a tightrope walk uh, that I can't always say I stick the landing. You don't have landings and tightrope walking. Well, I guess you do kind of have tightrope. Never mind. That's a terrible metaphor, and I'm over it. Hashtag some last-minute reboot guy accurate. Oh, and Gary the Fireman right out the gate with some Tier 1 subs to Drew4410, Vader's World, uh, Tay and Dalo, Cyber Birthday 10, and Gormlord. Gary, thank you so much. That is phenomenal. I, I really do appreciate it, and especially just for what we what we just did right here, trying to get the stream up and running. I can use all the help I can get. <laughs> but we've got uh, a whole slate of news to talk about. Um, for the gadget block, uh, I definitely want to circle back, share some thoughts on Xperia and TCL. We talked about it a bit on Best of Our Week, which we're going to talk about in housekeeping. Um, we're going to talk about how we talked about what we're going to talk about in housekeeping. And uh, I, I, just some some other thoughts on competition, what we expect from manufacturers, and then how we talk about different products. Um, again, it's it's some of the soapboxy stuff that I cover uh, regularly uh, on this channel. But I, I, I still want to kind of find some of the happy because if it's just, you know, you know, we're going to rail against this. And you're like uh, jumping into, uh, what was it, Twitter uh, Twitter spaces? I forget what their audio thing was. But, you know, th there, there is definitely a conversation brewing about how reviewers go about their business. What is a review? What are the expectations of the reviewer and the audience? And it, it just seems to be the right time to kind of follow through. You know, not it, 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 there's no one answer and there's no one conclusion. This is an ongoing and evolving style of media and style of commentary so we should continue to follow up and and uh check it out so um uh <laughs> dave burns 1300 is a little steep but you get much more phone than last year um i can't wait for it to get panned because the camera app decided to lean into the professional camera vibe so yeah it's um yeah, <laughs> there's going to be a lot of cranky one uh, talking about uh, Xperia 1 Mark III and not because of the phone. Uh, Utain Pico 1 is saying, hello, one bagel. I used to work at a bagel shop, so I got that a lot. I would like one bagel. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, and, uh, oh, and Utampico is also subscribed at tier one. Uh, well, thanks for jumping on, man. Oh, and apparently we're, we're, we're in line for a hype train. All right. Yeah, I've already been derailed a couple times. You know what? Why don't, why don't we cut through, uh, why don't we chew through housekeeping, get that out of the way. Um, and then we've got some, some, uh, the news block is a little bit slimmer and I keep saying this and, and someday I'll actually be able to, uh, to live up to, to what I'm describing, but, I don't expect the news block to be too heavy. So, um, oh, from Doomer, my computational photography. Um, yes, because uh, cameras lie and camera reviewers miss the point. And then what are we left with? We're left with a very uncompetitive uh, marketplace. All right. Housekeeping. I have been flying to try and get a couple different projects done. Um, and, and I'm trying to front load, you know, like I'm way behind on some audio gear. There's some headphones I really want to be talking about. Um, I want to do another 2020 hearing video on protecting children's hearing. Um, but at the same time, it's like, I, I, there are these accessories, like I'm really excited to talk about some of these accessories. So one that I finally got out the door and, and I shouldn't have put, like I put this, uh, I put this like, stupid rule on myself for reviewing products like fitness trackers you know like i really want to check out these battery claims so when amazfit sent over the t-rex pro and this thing legitimately gets like seven to ten days of battery life on my kind of usage which is is very low to moderate kind of fitness tracking but i get a lot of notifications uh yeah that that review took me way longer than it should have to finish <laughs> this this watch is a champ i very much enjoy it uh the video will go into a, a more detail as to why i am so taken with this fitness tracking product but it, it was also dumb of me to put this like th this threshold on how i was i'm gonna to honestly really dig into all of the nooks and crannies and you're like yeah I probably could have finished this video like two weeks ago. <laughs> it takes so long to cycle this thing. Um, what am I doing? Why Why am I making my job harder? And Dave Burns saying my GTR 2E is doing okay with battery life. And again, uh, Dave Burns just landed. I believe just got it a day or two ago. Uh, th that's another Amazfit fitness tracker. I've been very taken with them, but I really want to hear from folks that are that are working out uh, more regularly and tracking more diligently than I am. Um, so, because I, I don't believe that your battery life, when you're really hitting the GPS, when you're really you know doing always on heart rate tracking, when you're doing the blood ox, I think you're going to be hitting the battery harder than I will, and I think that's a more important data point to start comparing. My fitness tracking needs are probably lower level. Um, but the big video, and, and again, the commentary on this is very casual. I mean, like I set up a camera, I'm just sort of talking to the camera, and I'm not doing my normal, like, quick cut, punchy edit, you know, lots of B-roll, all that kind of stuff. But to accrue the data, to feel like I could competently discuss this issue took days, days of checking battery life, checking temperatures, running tests, playing games. And and it is, it, it is kind of a head trip. Like, like, well, I feel like I need to play this game for 30 minutes. And, you know, like if I could go back in time and tell like, you know, Super Nintendo era me that that was going to be a part of my job, I'd be like, that's awesome. You've succeeded in life. I'm so proud of me and you, me. Um, but, you know, the reality of it is, is like when I'm sitting down and I'm forced to play a game because I need to capture a battery stat. Like I'm not enjoying that. That's just a part of the job. Uh, so I'm, of course, dancing around uh, this video. Man, performance testing is getting hard. It's really difficult. This is the OnePlus 9 Pro throttled gaming. Are you getting premium performance? And this is another step of an evolving con uh, conversation as to what we should expect this year from premium tier devices. And increasingly, like I I've got this pendulum swing happening. Galaxy S21 comes out. I am not impressed with the performance that I see from the Galaxy S21. I'm not impressed with all the things Samsung cut out of the phone to try and achieve a lower price point. 
I'm not happy about the accessory situation. I don't like the build. I mean, like, I think the Galaxy S20 is a better phone if you were wanting to stay in the uh, Samsung ecosystem. And, uh, you know, what, what I needed was more data. The OnePlus 9 comes out, and in my, my more CPU-heavy tasks, uh, the OnePlus 9 easily you know, hangs with and outperforms the S21. It seems to run more consistently. It seems to handle thermal load better. Um, everything seems to be great. So I'm, I, you know, I start off the commentary there. And then we start seeing some other issues with gaming performance getting throttled. That's, that's where I've got a blind spot because a lot of the games that we're seeing the poor performance from the OnePlus 9 are not games that I play. And I, like I said, I don't, I don't want to spend extra time benchmarking games that I don't like to play. Uh, you know, when I'm, I'm really trying to chew through this Dead Cells DLC and I only get to do it in very sporadic chunks. <laughs> and, and also, if, if you like Dead Cells, let me tell you, playing Dead Cells on Android is like Dead Cells hard mode. <laughs> it's like whenever I get to play Dead Cells on a proper controller, it's like, oh, this is easy. <laughs> From Tech Love and Mama, I'm still not happy with what Samsung took from the Note 10 Plus to the Note 20 Ultra and Sad Bear Emoticon. I'm 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 kind of with you there. So, if we really care, and I feel we should really care when we're talking about devices that are in the premium tier, you know, above seven hundred dollars, peaking over a thousand dollars. I do not understand this mentality of choosing the label and then excusing the compromises of that label so that you can be on the winning team. A thousand dollars is a thousand dollars is a thousand dollars. You know, you're not going to win me with those arguments. Oh, well, I don't use my phone for any of that. Then why'd you spend a thousand dollars? Don't spend a thousand. Don't talk to your family and friends. You're a bad techie. <laughs> you're not good at this. And you're going to convince them to get, you know, a phone that they really don't need. And increasingly, like my family is all hyped up on mid rangers right now. Like, uh, you know, can, can, can I spend less on the, my new phone this year than I did on my old phone from two years ago? So, uh, to properly describe what's going on takes so much more work than running a quick Geekbench. And uh, I put out the call in the video. I've put out this call on numerous episodes of this podcast. Um, but if there's anyone out there I'm, I'm shouting into the void of the internet here. If there's anyone out there that you know of that consistently tests phone performance by using real world apps, video editing, audio editing and recording, uh, file compression, document work, not Geekbench, not Antutu, you don't use synthetic benchmarks to get your work done. So the, the testing protocol of something like Geekbench is running tiny, teeny little snippets of tests back to 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 back. These new processors, these new SOCs are really good at a short spike of performance and then a recovery and a short spike of performance and a recovery. They don't seem to be much better at sustained performance. And the only way we can take a look at that in, in, in real world, like in a way that actually delivers some kind of prediction and expectation of performance is by using a real app. And then just looking at how it rolls, just looking at how it performs. So if anyone else is out there, I mean, like there are a few that are that are doing this for gaming. Gaming, we actually care about looking at FPS and we care about looking at thermals and we care about looking at battery life. And there are a handful of reviewers that are keeping up with that. There is more that we do on a phone. And if the phone is more productivity focused, then we should have expectations of a higher degree of productivity. If a phone is more content creator focused, then we should have expectations of not only shooting, a co uh, shooting content, but maybe also finishing content from this platform. And increasingly we're seeing, you know, like when I was a kid, if I wanted to sh shoot a short movie, like I had to use film <laughs> or I, I could like get like a VHS camcorder and have absolutely garbage footage. 
Um, but, you know, what kept me from exploring some of the stuff that I wanted to try when I was younger was not having access to a camera, not being able to, you know, uh, develop film, not being able to edit any film that I would have developed. An entirely new generation of content creators and storytellers and filmmakers are starting with their phones. And not just, well, they shoot some clips and then they take it to a really fancy workstation that <laughs> they spent a lot of money on. No, 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 no. I'm seeing short horror films that are shot and finished on the phone. So this is the next generation of accessibility and content and, and creative storytelling. And, and to, to act like, well, I mean, $1,000 phone, I mean, that's just so you can have really nice Snapchats, you know, is, is completely reductive. And, and you can miss me with anyone who says average consumer spending over $1,000. So, <laughs> ah, rambling. <laughs> I'm all keyed up from like having to reset the stream. It at least seems to be hanging in there a bit more consistently than than. <laughs> I mean, at one point it dropped to um it dropped to 50 bits per second <laughs> the stream rate. And you're like, I cannot stream at 50 bits <laughs> per second. All right, uh, moving right along. Uh, this was a, a this this was a video that I kind of overlooked. I shot it. I had to send the Galaxy S21 back. Uh, TK was just letting me borrow it because I knew I wasn't going to spend a ton of time on the Galaxy S21 after that initial reaction. Uh, but I did get an audio review out. This is the Galaxy S21 audio deep dive, which is only half of an audio review, and it is. It's just so weird. It still feels so strange. Um, excuse me. I have been testing audio in some form or fashion for uh, like a long time. I can't even remember when my first audio test videos went up, but I want to say it was probably, I think I started doing speaker sample tests with the HTC One M7. And uh, it was one of the reasons why they brought me on at Pocket Now was the audio commentary and then the camera deep dive reviews that I would make. And uh Picking up an expensive phone and not having anything to complement um, the headphone performance is just so bizarre to me. It's just so strange, and and I I, I still haven't gotten used to it. Like I, I it was it was a stark change last year when headphone jacks were basically gone from Galaxies, and this year, like. Some of the improvements for USB DACs are fine, but like no pass through. Like there is no DAC in the Galaxy S21. There is nothing to output a signal for headphone owners. You have to buy some type of adapter, some type of Bluetooth solution. You have no option. Or even like um the OnePlus 9 Pro still has audio pass through. Like so if you have where is it? If you've got just the uh the inert you know, floppy dongle from OnePlus, the DAC is actually pretty decent. It, it puts out a respectable audio quality, and that's not on the Galaxy S21. You plug in a pass-through dongle, and it just goes, oh, USB device not recognized, man. You just don't be broke. <laughs> and like, this is not the future I want. I want better future, more tech, not less. <laughs> Root Night 5. Well, you can still test the, the out-of-the-box dongle. Oh, wait. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Bluetooth is one solution. I, I've been working with the folks at Qualcomm. I can tell you all about Snapdragon Sound, and I'm very excited about some of the improvements to consumer branding and consumer education and tying up different things like codecs and fast pair settings just under one label. Awesome. There are times I just want to plug in a really nice pair of headphones that I already own on a cable and listen in very high quality in it to, with an experience that I cannot currently replicate with any of the wireless solutions out there. So ugh. from do more, how would someone know if their phone has audio pass through or not? <laughs> you, you won't. Um, I, 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 this is, this is terrible. I, I, I'm about to do like the worst Patreon plug ever. Um, 
the so far as far as i know the only way for you to know that is to subscribe to my patreon and you'll only be able to know if i've reviewed the phone so i haven't had my hands on a xiaomi mi 11 or mi 11 ultra can't tell you can't tell you if there's audio pass through <laughs> But I can tell you that there is audio pass-through on the OnePlus 9 Pro. There, there, there's, there, again, audio commentary is so is so maligned right now. And, and, and basically the techie world has given up. Like there, there, there's no, there's no follow-through conversation. The, the audio file conversation around uh, the LG uh, announcement that they were pulling out of the smartphone business was so much more mature than most of the the techie conversation about LG. You saw a handful of videos go up going, man, this sucks. I have an LG V30. I have an LG V40. I don't flip my phone every year. I have this great phone that, that powers my headphones really, really well, and I'm going to stick with it. And you're like, yeah, yeah, audio files don't flip gear like techies, but they care. They care to know that this hardware is in there. And um, it's a shame because it's like one less option for those folks who didn't want to put more stress on their USB port or don't want to go to a hybrid DAC, like a Bluetooth you know, uh, pass-through DAC, or they don't want to go back to two devices just to have a nice premium audio experience. But they don't, they don't buy that many phones. So you you end up stuck if they were buying their phones every year and the audio file community were really backing that which seems so wasteful for what it is that they care about um that would be a different story all right um oh yes because i had to reboot none of my tabs have loaded uh we did have a, a longer conversation about uh, the xperia one mark three and the tcl 20 uh, best of our week, episode 17, uh, me and TK Bay. We, we revived Sony Watch because there was a new update for the Xperia 1 Mark II. Uh, we got the April update, and it also came with a pretty sizable chunk of, of other fixes and stuff. So where Android 11 was kind of off to a rocky start on the Xperia 1, and I feel like so many android 11 devices just need the hard reset at this point I, I know it doesn't seem like android 11 was a significantly um changed update over android 10 but there's enough stuff happening under the hood that i would recommend you, you, this is the time that you want to take do, do some spring to summer cleaning scrub out the phone start totally fresh and i think you're in for a better experience than just you know restoring a backup or just trying to go direct android 10 to android 11. i feel like the only phone that i did the 10 to 11 update and and like kind of had smooth sailing but it was also because we got you know, like immediate you know otas was the pixel everything else has, has gotten sticky in some situations so anyway um yeah we revived sony watch and and actually i probably should have gone all the way back to the xperia one mark one um, you know, this week on Sony Watch, because I just got my second update for Android 11 on the Xperia 1 Mark 1, and it's been so nice. Um, so again, uh, if you were shopping premium tier and you want good software support, for some reason we don't consider Sony in that conversation when they're actually pretty good. But yeah, we're going to talk a little bit more in the gadget block, uh, Xperia 1 Mark III, uh, what your folks, what, what your feelings are on sort of where we're going with premium tier phones. And then also some chatter on the, the TCL 22, um, uh, TCL 20 Pro, TCL 20 L, and TCL 20 S. Um, I'm very anxious about, uh, excited and anxious about uh, devices that are really trying to hit uh, this uh, mid-ranger 5G uh, competition territory then uh to wrap up <clears throat> to wrap up housekeeping i had a nice change of pace i teased it on last week's show but it's 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 finally out um breton on tour does a podcast called the journey for java and uh he likes to have other people on like musicians and and uh um, i think he's had an artist and and just coffee lovers in general but it's a coffee podcast they talk about coffee they talk about their favorite ways to brew coffee like what types of roasts and where the beans come from and 
this is exactly the kind of change of pace I needed. Uh, they wanted me to have, they wanted me on Brent, uh, Brenton wanted me on to, to obviously talk about tech and LG, but it, I needed a bit of a reset. Like I became the guy <laughs> to, to give quotes and jump on other folks' podcasts and videos to, to really talk about LG. Um, so I, it was refreshing to be like, so what's your favorite tip about coffee? And you're like, oh, well, I would recommend having a coffee buddy and, you know, sharing the social experience of consuming something that, that like tells a story through your senses. <laughs> I'm such a knob, but I love coffee. <laughs> uh, uh. So, um, yeah, even even for only getting two main videos out and the audio. Well, actually, no, I mean, I got two videos out in the audio deep dive and I was on another podcast and I did a lot of writing. Um, I'm, I'm through shooting the main talking to camera portion of my OnePlus 9 Pro camera review. And then I've got a side video for camera performance on the OnePlus 9. So that's going to take up a huge chunk of my week this week. So there probably won't be a ton of videos out. I might play with a few more shorts just to, just to kind of keep on the pulse with some of, uh, some of my little accessories coverage and stuff. Um, but it, it, it was a busier week than it seemed <laughs> trying to get through everything last week. So folks, uh, everything that we've talked about for the housekeeping and everything that we're going to talk about, all of the links, all of the show notes will be available after the audio version goes live on this podcast, somegadgetguy.com. Nick Fell is on coffee number five for the day. And I might be joining you. This, this feels like it might be, um, this might be a, a, a multiple return trip to my my drip coffee brewer just to just to kind of keep just kind of keep rolling on on what's going on here. And McCorkran three, um, you know, talking about some of the other coverage on LG devices. That's that's why I would recommend checking out some of the audio file videos. Um, I can't remember who it was, but brought up a similar thing, you know. I was watching this very popular tech commentator and he never mentioned the quad DAC in his goodbye LG video. It's like a major, a major component of what makes LG special. And I'm doing a terrible job of impersonating him. But I, I feel like those of us, especially if you've been watching content like mine and you, know, you weren't interested in buying an LG, but you were still interested in tech and competition, it wasn't painful to admit that LG was a champ at audio. Instead, we saw so many techies just, no, but no one cares about that and just brush it aside. And you're like, you're missing these communities that, that, that actually do care about the more well-rounded conversation about what makes a device unique. If you're only commenting on, these are the things that this phone does the same as a Sam Apple, but you should just buy a Sam Apple, then that is a a very vice grip blinders on kind of tech conversation. And I think that's why so many people kind of leave our community and we're not bringing in as many people to kind of replenish those, uh, those, uh, those ranks. Awesome. Possum. Totally agree. Coffee is King. Um, <laughs> Dave Burns. I mean, I think that starter pack showed what other technology hobbyists think of the YT tech crowd. And it, it, we, they don't think highly of us. It, it deservedly. So, um, <laughs> uh, oh, oh, sorry. I, I got a, a note to stretch. And I haven't stretched. I'm going to stretch. Ah. <sighs> so. Um, and Clifton, I can, I can kind of back that too. Can we not flame other creators here, please? Um, you'll notice I am very critical of review trends. I really don't like ginning up drama, individual YouTuber to YouTuber, individual reviewer to reviewer drama. What I, what I hope to accomplish by bringing this kind of commentary up is that we as a tech community recognize the trends of how media and manufacturers influence algorithms to train audiences to only accept binary choices. And, and I feel we can do that uh, and we can be extremely critical and I feel we can be very harsh 
but without necessarily stomping on one individual creator for exemplifying that trend. Um, it was why I got such a sick feeling out of writing that editorial I did on the Xperia 5 Mark II, um, review of a review, which wasn't really a review, but was commentary and was sort of lazily and shoddily produced. Immediately when I finished that article, I got about a half dozen DMs. You need to turn this into a video. You need to do a follow-up. You need to check out this other guy. He also doesn't review Sony properly. You need to reach out to this uh, sponsor because they, they need to know that this channel is putting out shoddy commentary. Like People wanted me to watchdog and go after another channel's sponsorships because of this commentary. You know, my point in making in writing that editorial was to show how hyper clear and specific these bad trends are. I feel we can call out the trends and I feel we should call out the trends and I feel like we should, we should rise to higher commentary, but, but this notion like, well, you just do you, you just make what you make. And, and you know, like the cream rises to the top and you're like, that doesn't exist. <laughs> That's not real. Um, I, I definitely sound bitter because like if I just make nice videos about the things I like and tell you what's cool about them, my comments are just assailed with people that can't handle that I'm not making a video about the thing that they own and I'm making videos about different things than what they own um, and everyone announces their departure from my channel like they're some kind of airport, which I don't care. So that's why I tend to lean antagonistic, but I'm really not trying to, to fight person to person, reviewer to reviewer, because then it's not about tech. The trend in the media literacy about what we do is part of the tech. How we use social media on our phones is a part of the tech. But if it's more just, you know, oh, Juan's got beef with this other reviewer, ooh, let's watch. Then basically what you're asking for is us to harm our mental well-being to feed you entertainment. And that's not what I'm about. <clears throat> so, um, let me take another sip of water here. Uh, so, um, yes, I, bad trends need to be examined. Uh, let's, let's, let's get through news because I'm already running a half hour <laughs> in, into this podcast and I only have a couple news stories here. Um, and, and one of them is amazeballs and, and gives me like what little hope for humanity I can still muster these days. Uh, first, there's a, there's a new story about politics and broadband. So, you know, I had to cover it. Um, I was not expecting this to pass actually, but this is a New York state bill and it was just signed off by governor Cuomo and I'm a little mixed feeling on this, but I'm hoping it, it sets the stage for a more federal response, a more FCC response. Uh, Governor Cuomo signs legislation establishing first in the nation program to provide affordable internet to low income families. Uh, program requires internet service providers to offer an affordable $15 per month high speed internet plan to low income households as proposed in the governor's 2021 state of the state. When this bill went up, I really didn't think, like even in New York, that this would get pushed through. And I'm of two minds of this. One, um, I would prefer to see New York State find other incentives for competition. Um, when we see a bill that directly targets how much an individual company can charge for a service, I think it kind of speaks to how little competition that market has. And when we look at some of the experiments for things like municipal broadband, you know, uh, or, or when an outside player can come in and roll fiber and it's not against one of the state laws to have two competing internet service providers in one area, that's the only time that we really see a true market-driven approach to improving service and dropping prices. Um, either the people of that area roll their own fiber and do a municipal broadband rollout, or the state opens up incentives to force another company into a competitive stance, or they allow like a Google fiber to roll into an area and then the market gets shook up. 
It's not going to come immediately from satellite. It's not going to come immediately from other terrestrial or, or 5G style solutions. At this point, I feel like the Internet's savior is probably going to be taxpayer funded municipal broadband. If we can't get companies to really come in and compete or they enter the area, but then they like half heartedly dump some low level DSL. You know, like, oh, you've got your choice. You can go Comcast or AT&T. They're the same price. They're they're broadband internets. And you're like, well, yeah, but one's cable and the other's DSL. Oh, no, that's competition. <laughs> that's not competition. But one of the interesting things about the way that this bill is formatted is that there's a a clause in here. I've, I've got to see if I can if I can scroll down and find this. Do, 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 do. Bum, 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 bum. It's not in their official document uh, right here. Uh, I, I completely lost my place from rebooting my computer, and I, I apologize here. So I, 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 I'll, I'll just have to uh, summarize this because I can't find where it is in this press release, but it will be in the show notes on this week's episode. Um, one of the interesting things about this bill is that it's also setting up a tier where the $15 a month that, that a, a low income uh, consumer might be able to qualify for, what they're expecting is either the faster of the two for the average speeds that that, that uh, ISP can offer in an area or the FCC definition of broadband, whichever's faster. And that's a critical, and I'll be very curious to see how this plays out and whether or not this is challenged. Um, the FCC definition of broadband is very slow. It's 25 megabit downloads. I mean, it's it's really not competitive on the global stage, stage and that's high speed as, as defined by our current regulatory body that oversees uh, the inter internet. But if the faster of those two is, you know, the average speeds in your area are more like 50 megabit or 100 megabit, you have to be able to offer a plan that $15 a month. What this might create though we know that the fcc is looking to expand the definition of broadband so if you want to offer a service and call it high speed internet right now we're seeing pressure to raise that cap to 100 megabit symmetrical and if that's the case then people who are on one of these affordable 15 dollar a month plans if the FCC raises that definition and New York's law takes into account the FCC definition but doesn't clearly define it by today's standards, then someone who needs help in the state of New York might eventually have access to a $15 a month internet plan with symmetrical 100 megabit connections. So that to me is what's kind of interesting here. What we need to see is, is I feel, more federal regulatory pressure on defining broadband, um, categorizing it correctly as a, as a telecommunication service, getting back to some of the low-level sort of global rules for net neutrality. And then from there, I think we've got better inroads to start expanding on our funding for rollouts. You know, this, the Biden administration is talking about billions of dollars of infrastructure, and broadband's going to be a part of that. But until we can qualify improvements, make sure everybody has some some access to something faster than, you know, like dial up and and has affordable access to that, then uh, we're not really making anything better for anyone. <clears throat> oh, yeah. And Comcast is uh, is definitely there, there's some chatter in here about Comcast also. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> putting caps back on their residential broadband. So short story, really long. I didn't really plan on spending that much time on it, but we all knew I was going to ramble on about internet. Um, let, definitely keep an eye. California and New York are going to be defining the next steps of the telecommunications industry. Um, it, it, until we, we deliver a mandate back to the FCC uh, to have some kind of regulatory oversight over how business is conducted online and, and how consumers connect to the Internet to do business online, it's going to be on the states and the two states with kind of the most money, the, the, the population density, the infrastructure, 
uh, the varying communities. There are very rural areas of California and New York. There are very urban areas of California and New York. Those two on, on, on opposite ends of the country are, are going to have the biggest impact on what happens in the middle of the country if we can't define some federal standard. So um, <clears throat> how about something a little lighter for a second news story? Something that is not really going to apply <laughs> to many more people than me. But you're on my podcast, so I've got to share this. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, how about some talk, uh, uh, over video codecs and video APIs? Uh, this was a crazy little announcement. So, uh, this is coming by way of XDA developers written up by Corbin, uh, Davenport. The Vulcan video API could help video editors be less terrible. So, I mean, that, that's kind of a, it's kind of an outrage title because like, if you've been using the most recent updates to power director and Kinemaster, like those apps have gotten surprisingly good i digress um the rest of the article has legit substance to it and so the uh the the final spec for vulcan which is a, a graphics framework oh right here um is cross-platform competitor to microsoft's direct x becoming the true successor to the aging OpenGL architecture um the spec was finalized a year ago but they're now announcing professional Vulcan video acceleration extensions. So um, I'm not going to spend a ton of time on this because I totally understand why people's eyes are, are likely rolling into the back of their skull. What we're looking at is better hardware support for apps to utilize the, the GPU components in mobile devices and ARM devices and anything that has support for Vulcan uh, to leverage that hardware for video acceleration or some type of video manipulation. So much lower CPU overhead, better utilization of GPU hardware, make everyone happy. So it's kind of like when on desktops, we started going from CPU rendering to GPU rendering and just how much faster and smoother and, and the power overhead I, I, everything got better. Um, and, and the same thing, you know, like I, I now cut out of DaVinci Resolve. I, I haven't found anything that really leverages my GPU uh, as well as Resolve does. So when I'm going through my timeline with 4K 60 frame per second video, 8K footage from phones, and I can hear the fans on my GPU are definitely spinning up, but it, it's it's functional and I can really scrub that timeline and I can really follow what's going on. Um, this is this this would be really killer to see this type of hardware utilization finally make it to phones. Um, your, your ability to craft content, manipulate content, slice together a quick TikTok, get in, get out. I mean, it's already impressive what we can do with a phone. If if this completely wrecks all of my smartphone benchmarks, it will make me so happy. <laughs> it, it would it would just like this would be a, a, a an evolutionary leap over what we were capable of before so uh lots of support for other video formats codecs this would be this would be the right the the the, the right time to give it a nudge Dave Burns. Yeah, but people don't do stuff on their phones, you silly goose. I just make cool videos in TikTok. That's not video editing. <laughs> yeah, I get that a lot. <laughs> oh, Gary the Fireman is saying, the township I live in gave Cablevision, now Optimum uh, Altice, I don't know what that company is, a 100-year exclusive for cable TV. I cannot get Fios even if I wanted it. Holy snap. See, you know, when we talk about like broadband at the city level, at the township level, at the state level, it takes so little for a mega corporation to roll in, help guide some uh, legislation, and then roll right on out and have some kind of exclusivity in a very monopolistic fashion. And that's, that's really sad, man. I'm sorry to hear that. So... Uh, the big news, and uh, th this is the top news story of the week. I, you know, if, if you're a nerd, I can't think of anything cooler 
Uh, we're flying helicopters on Mars. I'm gonna I'm gonna go back here. Uh, it we we have a successful launch of a helicopter on another planet. We are airborne with robots on Mars. Ingenuity. A techno a technology demonstration to test the first powered flight on Mars. The helicopter rode to Mars attached to the belly of the Perseverance rover. We have we had a successful launch. It went airborne. I, I'm I'm blown away. I, I just the 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 magic of what we have accomplished and what NASA has achieved here just blows my mind. And and that we're getting video back from it that we'll be able to utilize this in in future uh, you know explorations of of other. Growing up and watching way too much science fiction, you know, one one of the things that like kind of blows about the charm of shows like Star Trek is for very good reasons, and especially with the the technology for storytelling that we had at the time, <clears throat> a lot a lot of those TV shows and movies had to sort of abbreviate space. You know, Star Trek makes space not very scary. You know, the, the actual danger of space travel is very rarely explored um, in a show like Star Trek. And just how incredibly complex, very basic navigation, um, very basic, you know, life support issues. You know, <laughs> Star Trek had to come up with magic to overcome the problem of inertia, right? You know, like if you really, you had engines that could very quickly propel your ship to like one quarter of the speed of light. If you just pushed the go button, any human life on that ship would just be slammed against the back wall and would turn into jello. Like you would liquefy everybody on that ship. And so Star Trek had to come up with a solution around that through techno jargon and gobbledy gook. And we've got a deflector grid and inertia dampeners. <laughs> there you go. We dampen inertia. That's magic you, know, you might as well have like a wizard with a staff on the bridge of the enterprise every single time they need to use an impulse engine um when you really break down just how many agencies had to get involved the the insane number of people working together to collaborate on the hardware on the software on just doing that work so that we could get a goofy little helicopter drone on on another planet. And then not even knowing, you know, like, we had a pretty good idea. It should fly. They did a couple test spins, spin ups of the blades. You don't know until you really do it. And then you do it and it works and it's successful. And that's, that's amazing. Um, especially for anyone who's watching this right now, uh, I, I'm really gonna be working to end my podcast hard um, at two hours. At 11 a.m. Pacific time, as soon as my podcast is over, so definitely stay tuned for the rest of the podcast here, NASA is going to do a follow-up briefing on the first flight. And I hope everyone here um, will check it out. If you're, if you're catching this on the replay crew or if you're listening to the audio version of this podcast, go to mars.nasa.gov. And again, it's going to be in the show, show notes, but um, ca catch, catch this media, you know, the, the follow-up, the briefing. Like this is an incredible accomplishment, and uh, you know the team at NASA. I I'm sure the team at NASA and their families are are just over the moon that this was a successful flight. Um, you know this this is a drone version of the Wright brothers on Mars. You know, like we've had things rolling around on Mars. It's the first thing to fly on Mars, and it just kind of lights me up in that little kid kind of way. Like this is the real magic. This is you know like it's not magic. You know, like we actually did it. It's not inertia dampeners on the Enterprise. So, um, NASA, uh, mars.nasa.gov, uh, so much media here too. And even just silly things, you know, like I, I might do this with Lex, um, the little paper craft, you know, activities for kids, code a Mars helicopter video game, or how to make your own paper helicopter. And like, you know, I think I'm going to share this with my daughter. I think I think this is definitely something that we need to do. <laughs> 
So uh, that's that's all the news. That's our news block. Uh, it ran longer than I wanted it to, but uh, 11 a.m. after this podcast, NASA briefing. I'm there. I hope you will be there too. Excuse me. Let's take a quick break here just to chat out the subreddit. Um, I, again, my my links are all reloading right now, so let me make sure that yeah, there we go. Okay. Every podcast has a subreddit. Mine is no exception. And uh, if you go to reddit.com slash r slash glowing rectangles, you're going to see a community of folks trying to share content that they feel deserves more attention. And that's the focus. It's not, you know, uh, send me cool news clips or let me make a fan page for my podcast. It's really, can we make a broader coalition of tech reviewers, commentators, people doing fun things with technology and share that in a way where we can kind of help give channels a nudge when we feel they deserve a nudge. Um, Because it's definitely not the current flavor of YouTube helping people build and grow or even just sustain. So reddit.com slash r slash glowing rectangles. We're we're comfortably over 1,700 subscribers now. It's a true grassroots, you know, person by person, article by article, video by video. And it's it's growing and I love it. And this is now more often where I'm going to find tech commentary than what YouTube is giving me in my feed. So uh, number one. Uh, with a bullet, I don't know if Matt Tyler is, is still in the live chat, but, uh, some punchable face dude with a really cool flat cap is the number one video this week. Ooh, ooh. <laughs> one plus nine pro throttled. So my video talking about my performance testing issues on the one plus nine pro definitely took the top spot because I'm awesome. I love it. Uh, number two, Techspert, sharing some thoughts on the Xperia 1 Mark III, uh, looking at the announcement and just kind of giving us a reaction. Uh, the number three position, Google and Sony team up to add 360 reality audio, an article from XDA developers talking about speaker tech and audio tech coming from Sony and Google. Definitely a good read if you care about audio because Sony is contributing a lot of media expertise to Android right now. I wonder why Sony might be interested in sprucing up Android's ability to deliver good audio and video. Hmm. Uh, just rounding out, uh, the podcast last week actually made uh, an appearance. The podcasts usually don't score as well, but in the number four position. And in the top five, we round out with Adam, Re- Adam Reviews Tech looking at the iPhone 11 Pro versus the Pro Max in 2021. Um, And then just some fun things, like uh, I shared a video on uh, smoothing out the frame rate of stop motion animation. So what if Jason and the Argonauts uh, was a 120 frame per second movie instead of a 24 frame per second movie? Um, Someone shared this, Tech Space Cowboy, a channel that I was not familiar with before, uh, took a look back at the Microsoft Duo. We've got Josh Vergara sharing some, um, some concerns over the Poco F3. My Amazfit T-Rex, uh, some people talking about the LG Wing on sale, uh, someone else sharing their thoughts on buying their last LG. They opted for the V60. OnePlus 9 versus Pixel 4a camera comparison from Fandroid, um, and a lot of Xperia 1 Mark III commentary just throughout the week. So it was a real busy week. These last couple weeks have been real busy weeks on reddit.com slash r slash glowing rectangles. And, and like I said, I'm finding... Real cool stuff that I'm, I'm really digging. Aditya, no, Adam Dowd's uh, S21 versus iPhone 12 Pro video was really good. The commentary was well-paced and informative with real-life use anecdotes. We need more of that. And you will not find more of that just casually browsing YouTube. Now, you've got to go out of your way to seek out communities of people that are actually going to gonna kind of you know serve this stuff up to you and help you find it because uh every time i subscribe to so yeah i where, where was hold on i gotta go down to um tech space cowboy has 2500 subscribers and i clicked on his channel and after i clicked on subscribe on his channel youtube recommended that i also check out dave 2d well if you like tech commentary you must you would rather watch tech commentary from this guy with millions of subscribers right and, and again, if you look at my subscribers, uh, the, the channels that I subscribe to, um, 
I cannot give YouTube better data that I am actively trying to find medium sized and smaller channels. Like that, that is my, that, that, that is my uh, driving um, challenge just that what I'm trying to achieve by seeking out tech commentary on YouTube every single time. Well, you must want to follow on box therapy. <laughs> you like tech and it's so gross. Um, I, it's like you, the algorithm is really not taking my viewing into consideration. And it really is just whatever's most popular because that's going to be easiest for us to kind of spoon feed the broadest audience. So go to reddit.com slash r slash glowing rectangles and you're going to find a much different flavor of that kind of tech commentary and a community of people that are actively trying to share a broader look at consumer electronics. <clears throat> tech love and mama when i see my videos being shared on glowing rectangles it's cool i appreciate that you have this available to all of us please I, again we're getting more submissions we're we're starting to see more uh upvotes especially uh, top posts hitting double digit you know upvotes we need the participation you know uh sharing <clears throat> is always critical uh, sharing on other social uh social social media services sharing on other subreddits like you can cross post if you go to glowing rectangles and you see an article and you're like, oh, you know what? This would be a great fit for this other subreddit or this other community. You know, don't just share the link, but cross post and, and make sure that you're sort of using that. And then the more you share on glowing rectangles, the more karma you're going to build. People take you more seriously on Reddit. It's it's a whole thing unto itself. But, you know, it, it's a, it, it's definitely a resource to help build a community and then also Try and get folks active. Um, if you if you care about this, it's not just enough to passively watch anymore. Like that doesn't that doesn't move the needle. It's getting in there and participating, upvoting, commenting, sharing. We we need all the all the help we can get. Uh, literally, like that that's what's going to make the difference between finding more tech chat and instead just relying on a couple tentpole channels and that's all you're really going to see. So, uh, last plug, reddit.com slash r slash glow and rectangles and tell them one sent you because I'm like the, the top mod there. So I'll, I'll know I sent me to you, to you, to me. It's great. All right. Uh, let me, uh, <sighs> ah, I'm just catching up on the chat here. Do, 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 do. <laughs> Simon says, Hypno, I know that pain. I can't even watch any political commentaries without YouTube filling my feed with extreme right or left wing videos. Um, I watched uh, someone sort of deep dive, uh, sort of a it, it's it's a documentary. I mean, it really is. It's like 90 minutes long and uh, talking about flat earthers. This is beautifully produced, goes down, goes down the rabbit hole really speaks to the philosophy of, of this kind of group think and, and the spread of bad information and how it can kind of corrupt people that are naturally curious and, and, and are intellectually you know, curious about how the world works, but then kind of pollutes them with, you know, bad assumptions uh, and, and makes them much more susceptible to really terrible um, alternative reality thinking. Um, and now my YouTube recommendations are a hot mess. <laughs> I watched one video and I can look at, oh no, oh no. <laughs> oh, I don't want to watch another video about incels. Oh no, what did you do, YouTube? And this is like when I like unplug out of everything from YouTube and then just like, I, I just want to watch short horror films. I'm just going to do nothing but watch short horror films and and like... Yeah, movie reviews, because I've got to, like, trick the algorithm into not trying to recommend stuff. Um, and Saeed Ted is saying, uh, got to actively engage. So, um, yeah, it's 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 a biggie. Oh, Fat Produce is listening to this while packing. That must mean that Fat Produce is moving to his new place, and everyone needs to give him a huge, hearty congratulations, because... Uh, uh, I, I got to see a, a picture of his new house, and it looks pretty sweet. So, um, 
<laughs> from Alice Bockley, most of today's news is short horror films. This is true. All right, let, let's uh, let's jump into the gadget block here because I want to save you know the bulk of the time for talking about camera tech and Xperia. This just seemed like an oddity, and and I'd be curious. L let me get some comments on on what you think. If you run a service, is hardware a thing for you? Um, like think of uh, like Snapchat. Snapchat is this social media service. It's about sharing snippets of video and 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 they they tried I you know I honestly don't even know if they still sell them but the Snapchat spectacles were were a thing that were really exciting for just a hot minute you know having little cameras right at, right at eye level for a different type of you know more organic first person sharing of, of media and content um is that a sign of your service growing and that it's healthy and that you're looking at alternative revenue streams and bringing people in with novel hardware experiences or is that a sign that your service is kind of struggling and you're trying to find a novelty which is going to get people talking and interested in this because i'm curious why now is the right time for spotify to launch the car thing uh, this is from carthing.spotify.com say hi to car thing the smart player from Spotify that fills your car with music, news, entertainment, talk, and more. And it's basically a little rectangle with a knob that you can use to scroll through uh, stuff on the screen. And it connects to your phone, uses your phone's data to stream Spotify to your car stereo. I'm, I'm not entirely sure... Well, first of all, I don't want to knock it. I mean, this could be really cool. I, I I have family that are still using like little XM radio receivers, right? There is something kind of interesting about having a dedicated, focused hardware interface for fill in the blank. <clears throat> and so something like this immediately recalls like those little XM satellite radio receivers, but it's for Spotify. But when we're talking about integrating into a car, like they show it on a little dash mount um, connected to an air conditioner vent. Well, that's kind of where I already put my phone. So if I already have my phone mounted above my car's terrible entertainment system, I don't have room. <laughs> I don't have a place to put um, the, uh, the car thing. And, and so it's supposed to integrate into Android Auto and Apple CarPlay. Uh, you, know, you can plug it into like the USB or the, uh, if you have an auxiliary jack, like a headphone jack in your car, you can plug it in that way. And then it connects to the data that your phone uses to stream this over. So I'm just kind of kind of curious, you know, there, there's a part of me that, that, that wants to be really excited about a service coming up with a hardware specific interaction at the same time i get twitchy because it's kind of what my phone already does and it, it obviously my phone does not have big tactile knob and click knob and click is really handy in an automobile i do like knob and click for operating something when i'm supposed to also be keeping my eyes on the road but <laughs> minus knob and click i feel like my phone is already taking that physical location. So I'm I'm torn. I want to I really want to be more excited about the novelty of this. I really want to be more interested in in a first hardware play from a software service, but uh, is this the thing? Is this what cuz you know, in my brain I feel like the I feel like the missed opportunity is a Spotify collaboration or a Spotify line of of audio reproduction hardware, you know, like a Spotify Bluetooth speaker, a Spotify pair of headphones, a Spotify Bluetooth DAC, you know, maybe in maybe not even making their own, like license some stuff out from Fio and and sell that as part of like a Spotify kit. And oh, if you want to listen in higher quality and you're paying for Spotify premium, these are some solutions and you can do this through our store and we'll put a little Spotify sticker on there because that's where you got it from. I feel like there's there's hardware that's being overlooked and I'm not 
I, I and please tell me in the chat if you think I'm totally off base here, if you think I'm totally wrong, but I'm not sure that solving the car playing situation was really the hurdle preventing people from enjoying Spotify to, to their maximum. <clears throat> From JJ, I think they're aiming at older cars with no media console. I I don't know that they are. When one of the major talking points is, hey, you can plug this into the USB port of your car, which supports Android Auto or Apple CarPlay, I don't think that's the killer hook. And that this does need to be powered some way. And so if you don't have the USB accessibility, then you've got to plug it in through the cigarette lighter port and then also connect a 3.5 millimeter cable to an auxiliary jack and your car has to have that. Um, it really does seem that like the preferred connection is USB, which I'm not sure is an older phone focus. Because if it were just Bluetooth, then again, your phone would just connect to the Bluetooth of a car. So again, it's... I'm I'm... I'm not grokking it, and I feel like I'm missing something. Um, from Clifton Thomas, this feels like such, this feels like, oh, sorry, this feels like such limited appeal when most new vehicles have Android Auto and Apple CarPlay integrated. Um, it, you know, my car doesn't. Uh, my, my Nissan has a terrible in-dash entertainment system, but it does have USB connectivity, which works with some devices, and it does have an auxiliary port, and it has Bluetooth. So again, when I need to bump some tunes, my phone connects fast to Bluetooth. And that's generally fine when you're fighting road noise and you just want to kind of stream some audio. Um, Aditya Anil is kind of in the same boat as me. Why does this exist? Doesn't our phone do the same thing? Um, Simon says Hypno. Okay, so this is a different perspective. The Echo Auto for 25 bucks was a boon for our old van. It worked a treat. Something like that actually make, makes a little bit of sense. I'm just, I, I'd be curious like how the Echo Auto compares to something like this because there's no battery. It, I don't think it's got Bluetooth for connecting to the car. It's got a, it's got antennas so that you can uh, deliver voice actions to to control your music, which I, I guess that's cool. Um, if your if you can play music from your phone on your car stereo today, this oh it will okay so this will work using a USB outlet, Bluetooth, and aux. So it does it, it will also connect to a car over Bluetooth. <laughs> but so you connect this to your phone. So you connect it to the phone. I'm assuming you would use that with Bluetooth for the data connection, and then it connects to your car over Bluetooth. Again, it just seems like such an odd middleman. I, 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 I'm, I am much confused. Um, and McCorcoran's been using Amazon HD, Amazon Music HD for quite a bit. Uh, let's see. Uh, Dave Burns, I left Spotify a long time ago. I really am not a big fan of music streaming. I like owning my own media. I, I do both. Um, so I, I, I do like music streaming just in a pinch. I'm not paying for any service at present. Um, like I'm, I know that's terrible and it makes, it gives the artists even less money when it's just ad supported. But I also keep a, a huge um, music collection of the content that I really, really, really love. So I, I, I like streaming for filling in the gaps, but you know, my car has a USB plug that reads flash drives and I just keep a monster flash drive full so that I always have a music library at the ready, no matter what my data connection is looking like. And Dave Burns, streaming on Plex has been pretty eye-opening. Totally agree, totally agree. If you're managing your own media server and you're using a service like Plex, you see the competitive edge of kind of curating your own collection and the soundtracking of other services becomes a little less, uh, I don't know, it's it's like a, a little less competitive. You know, like the ease of use, I totally get it. And someone doesn't want to build a music collection, like I've been ripping CDs and, and trying to find uh, 
24-bit FLAC downloads, totally get it. But if you've been doing that, that's kind of where I, I, I lean the heaviest. Um, from Kyotura Santi, it looks interesting, but I already use the aux on my V60. Fair enough. Um, Fat Produce, I got to try out Android Auto in my dad's truck dash via USB for the first time, and it was a great experience. I'm really glad to hear that. Um, where is, sorry, I'm catching up on the rest of the chat here. From JJ, do you think Spotify would cater more software support than the standard infotainment system? Um, uh, well, I'm, I'm not entirely sure what you're asking there. I, you see, this is what's also kind of tricky about a first gen product is what is the update situation going to look like? How is this thing going to be maintenanced? Obviously it's going to have some issues when it first launches, all new products do. It's just, I don't know. I, I, I'm spending, again, I'm spending way too much time on this than I'd really intended to, but it, it keeps bringing up more questions and I'm, I'm, I'm kind of trying to fit my brain around who is the right person for this. And I'm not sure who that person is. So it's causing a bit of a lockup in my brain. <clears throat> awesome. Awesome. Some gadget guy ready to DJ at a moment's notice. <laughs> my, my very eclectic and broad, but shallow musical tastes would make for terrible DJing. I, I DJed my uncle's wedding um, and I am not a DJ. And I think I did okay. I don't think I was terrible. I don't think I was great. All right. Um, so who wants to chat about the Xperia? <clears throat> uh, I, I, have, uh, I have been struggling to kind of plan out my year. Um, the, uh, the last two years, I've kind of, I, 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 I've had a format for certain phones arriving at certain times and, uh, excuse me. Um, one of, one of my, my favorite showdowns, my favorite head to heads over these last two years has been LG versus Sony. So from the V50 versus the Xperia one Mark one to the V60 versus the Xperia 1 Mark II, increasingly watching these phones do battle in a high level content creator, multimedia focused kind of way, um, but still with very different uh, ways of achieving that. Like the, the V50 versus the Xperia 1 Mark I, I would still say both of those phones are creator focused phones that have some great things to offer multimedia and gaming, but they go about it in very different ways. And, and over these last two years, 2019, 2020, um, that was a, the most exciting part of this conversation is that it's not like we got to creator phone and then there was only one way to do that. Um, Xperia 1 Mark II versus V60, likewise, very different usage scenarios where I would feel more comfortable recommending one phone over the other. I feel like the Xperia 1 Mark II, more of a, a storyteller, a narrative, um, fi finding those opportunities to craft a piece of content, and you're really the guy behind the camera. V60, much better, run and gun, newsier, vloggier, YouTubery kinds of content, the preferred, the preferred solution. So there, there, there's never been this like, well, you know, if you have a phone for gaming, we kind of we kind of get like what that's going to be, you know, uh, better attention to thermals, bigger batteries, and then chunky Mountain Dew fueled design. Content creation versus mobile journalism versus short films and storytelling versus documentary versus all of these different ways that we create con versus podcasts, how you record audio. All these things are tackled in very different ways. And, you know, now we don't have the LG version of that coming this year. But, you know, kicking, kicking this off, um, you know, one of the things that we're starting to get some info on, this obviously hasn't been a 
officially confirmed, but this has kind of fallen in line with what I what I was thinking we would arrive at. Um, Sony Xperia 1 Mark III arrives for pre-order in Russia at $1,300. So uh, we don't know what pricing is going to look like uh, internationally or in the United States, but this is kind of in line with where I thought Sony would go. So uh, this is written up by Jordan over at GSM Arena. Sony announced its third generation of Xperia 1 and Xperia 5 flagships yesterday, stayed silent on pricing and availability. However, now the two phones are listed for pre-order on Sony's Russia's on Sony Russia's official store, along with their pricing. Xperia 1 Mark III is $1,300, while the Xperia 5 is just over $1,100. And so they actually list the prices in Russian rubles. Um, we're looking at around 1,100 euro for the Xperia 1 Mark III with 12 gigs of RAM and 256 gigabytes of storage. Um, importantly, Sony will throw in a pair of WF-1000XM3 earphones for free. Well, they're not really throwing it in for free because you're paying $1,300 for, for a phone. But this is kind of where I was thinking Sony was going to land. I, I was very frustrated after the Sony announcement to see so many techies basically say the quiet parts out loud. Oh, look, Sony's announcing early, but we don't know when they'll actually ship. Oh, well, what a fail. There's going to be no excitement over this phone. And you're like, you can still be excited about a phone that announces early and ships late. That's on you. <laughs> you know, I don't get me wrong. I'm annoyed that Sony marketing probably won't give this a big spectacle of a launch when it really launches in our region. You know, like we're not going to see Sony Xperia billboards in the United States. We're not going to see Sony Xperia television commercials. That's what I want. I don't care when you announce. I'd love to see the company make more noise in traditional advertising and marketing when it's available to buy. We know Sony probably won't. But to, to then say, because Sony isn't going to make more it isn't going to spend billions of dollars on marketing there's no reason to get excited about this phone is so incorrect sony has to announce earlier than they can really ship because they're going to continuously seed room to competitors at least now the the sort of cadre of sony uh smartphone shoppers where sony's smartphone division is profitable it is making money they know there's a phone to wait for, and they know it's a Sony premium tier device. And when you talk about Samsung in the premium tier space, you talk about a very stratified experience. From Galaxy S21 to S21 Ultra, they're very different phones. They're, 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 they, they, shouldn't, they really shouldn't be called S21s. The, the experience is so markedly and starkly different from build material, to capabilities, to camera quality, they're not the same. But that gives Samsung the room to say, S21 started like $700, but not really, because your S21 Ultra is not the same device. So there, there's a little DNA <laughs> being shared. We know Sony's not going to play that game. Um, th there are going to be a trio of phones in Xperia 10, Xperia 5, Xperia 1, um, you know, that's that's the order from mid-ranger to premium consumer to ultra high end. And that's where Sony plays. So when, when we talk about premium, especially in a consumer facing device, but with a heavy focus on cameras and optics, it makes a ton of sense to me. It makes a ton of sense to me that they're not going to whittle stuff back and then just try and compete on mid-ranger pricing. That's not Sony. They're, they're a very uh, baller... And, and kind of arrogant company. You know, this is the company that told people you should want to save up. You should want to save your money to get one of these PlayStation 3s. Um, it's going to be a very expensive console. You know, we're not going to make a cheaper console. <laughs> we're Sony. And, and whether or not you feel like Sony has the clout to do this in the phone space is all just a, is a, is all just a function of marketing. When people and 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 in in this chat, I mean, obviously, for how much I've talked about why I liked LG smartphones, the Xperia becomes an immediate device to consider 
because it's more a phone for me. Um, I, I don't want to give up memory card expansion. I don't want to give up a headphone jack. I prefer having a phone that has zero interruption, no punch hole, no notch. And, and I want a phone that's going to take power management and thermal uh, handling thermals more seriously than Samsung does. When we talk about Samsung arriving at a lower price point, they cut a lot of corners to get there. This is the only phone I'm seeing from sort of traditional manufacturers. Oh, you know what? I'll, I'll take that back. This is this phone in the, the ROG 5, that they're not only holding steady with their previous device, they're adding stuff to it. They're refining it. They're adding more and making it better, not just, oh, well, you got to go cheap. Now, Samsung set the price for a Snapdragon 888 at real cheap. So uh, it's not worth considering any other phone because Samsungs are cheap. <laughs> Just because you can save cash on a phone doesn't mean it's a better phone. So uh, when, when I when I see this, you know, where the Xperia 1 Mark II was roughly a $1,200, $1,200 device, adding better support for Sub-6, um, I'm assuming we're going to see some consideration for Sony for thermal uh, thermal hardware. If it's like the vapor chamber that was in the Xperia Pro, that would be rad if we could really get that paired up with an 888. Seeing the next generation of power management and battery management. We're seeing a two-stage telescoping telephoto camera sensor. Uh, we're seeing improvements to sm uh, video capture and, and content creation. And they're also refining some of their, their software. So, you know, uh, some of the criticisms about not having the easiest auto mode that's going to get rolled into the photo app and will hopefully help tech reviewers who never really use these things in earnest, but just like to complain about them. So um, every every piece of this has gotten better. Every every little section of this does seem to be an upgrade over the one Mark II. Um, where, where I'm concerned is also sort of vaguely where I'm concerned against Xiaomi's, against Galaxy's, against the one pluses. You need to work harder to make this chip run better. Um, you need to build the phone around the Snapdragon 888 and really handle what that chip puts out. And if you don't, you end up with a much poorer experience consistent, uh, consistently for longer term interactions and for um, you know, sort of average performance over longer interactions than you did last year. That's maybe fine on a Samsung. I don't know. Um, you know, reviewers who focus on Samsung seem to have a very low estimation of what consumers do on their phones. It's it's markedly more dangerous territory for a Sony. It's more dangerous territory because of all the work Sony has done in linking the Xperia division with their high end camera division. A Sony Alpha consumer and a, a person who wants to be in the Sony ecosystem is gonna have a very different expectation on performance over average consumers. Um, when, when Sony says pro, they mean pro. And when you look at the way that they've even named their new phones, again, I, I'm loving all of the techies are going, oh, this is uh, X, uh, Xperia 1 III. I mean, how do you even say that? Um, you, you're really bad at tech. Um, it's like cameras, you know, if you go to a Canon 500D, that's an entry level device, the smaller the number gets, the better the phone, the better the camera gets, right? So 500D to 50D to 5D to 1D, that's a line of Canon cameras. That's all the explanation you need. Xperia 10 to Xperia 5 to Xperia 1. Easy. There it is. There's your explanation. And then you just have generation tick marks, you know, one uh, in Xperia 1 Mark 1, Xperia 1 Mark 2, Xperia 1 Mark 3. It's really not that hard. So um, digging into what Sony announced, um, <laughs> let me get a drink of water here. Oh, and Gabaletta, the space constraint in smartphones is evident and highlighted with the Snapdragon 865, even more so on the 888. We're reaching the point of needing active cooling to keep these SOCs cool. My, my concerns, um, well, first of all, if you build the phone properly around this chipset, it's not, 
it's not consistently a conversation about better than the 865. You do need to be a bit more selective. But often when you take into consideration optimization for a particular platform from a manufacturer, if you take that out, then, excuse me, a OnePlus 9 Pro seems to consistently best the performance of 865s in a number of my tests. Um, I know I, I did a video about how OnePlus was throttling graphics performance, right? Well, that comes down to what games you play. And there are ways that you can kind of get around some of that thermal throttling, but there are some really heavily demanding uh, console and PC ports that you can play on Android where a Snapdragon 865 is floating around 40 frames per second. And the OnePlus can consistently over the same time period keep up at 60 frames per second, but a Galaxy S21 is gonna crater to 30 frames per second. So again, if you build the phone around that heat properly, you will see benefits, you will see an upgrade, but it's hard to know. It's hard to know if the manufacturer really did their due diligence. You don't wanna spend money on a phone, try to use it in a short, like, you know, you get a two week grace period before you need to return it. And then you're not really using the phone, you're testing the phone, you know what I mean? Like, you're not living with it, you don't know if it's really gonna fit your needs because you gotta spend all that time running benchmarks. Um, when when I run a, a OnePlus 9 through video editing and rendering, you know, it, when I run a OnePlus 9 through batch photo processing, which is very surprising. And this is also one of the things like, Sony's were surprisingly good at manipulating raw files from, from standalone cameras. And now the OnePlus 9 is my peak performer. And, and in a big batch of photos, it's, it's running the, the fastest and the most consistently. So, um, I have very high expectations on a $1,300 phone that Sony is going to address the real hardware of this, but that costs money. You can't do that on the cheap and still include, uh, you know, boundary pushing display tech and still include monster camera performance and still include better software support. You know, you can get incredible hardware on a gaming phone. I haven't seen evidence that software updates on gaming phones have gotten better. <laughs> and there are some some issues with, you know, like build quality and 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 how how these devices are constructed so that they can hit lower price points and and still achieve this this kind of game gamer moniker and notoriety. So Sony is not playing that game. They're not going to try and sell a phone at margin. They're not going to try and sell a phone at cost. You know, they're not going to make a bunch of Xperia's and then cut the price a week later and to try and entice consumers. This is this is going to be built in smaller batches, um, smaller unit sales, specifically catering to folks that um, have a very different focus and expectation on mobile performance. Um, I'm 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 very I'm very excited about it, especially since I'm not on AT and T. Um, which this increasingly seems like it's an AT&T problem. You know, oh, OnePlus doesn't support AT&T 5G. I think it's the other way around. I feel like AT&T 5G is launching and rolling out in a way where manufacturers couldn't as easily support it. And those costs are high. So instead, wait another year until AT&T figures their ish out and then include better support for AT&T 5G. Dave Burns, AT&T doesn't support 5G. Um, and TK Bay, everyone say hey to TK Bay. Um, thank you for jumping in, buddy. I, I appreciate it. Gaming phones update very slowly, sadly. So, um, yeah. Uh, I'm, 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 I'm perusing over Xperia. Oh, I had another... Um, I had another link up, and now I can't you know let me just go back to the sony site <laughs> we can check out the sony gallery um oh these photos are gonna look awful on my streaming setup uh hold on let me let me just go back to the sony web page <laughs> um upgrades upgrades all around uh where, where i'm i'm really excited 
uh, Sony's conversation about camera tech is a little different. Um, you know, I, I've been saying things, you know, like, oh, well, what we're talking about is is a higher tier of content creation, more cinematic, a more uh, a more of a focus on narrative and storytelling. And so a part of this gets caught up in the expected use from a community of people who will probably better understand light. Um, you know, there, there have been a lot of criticisms. Let me let me kind of chew through the specifications and make sure I, I've got this. Correct, because I don't think we're going to see radical changes to um, like to the main camera sensors here. Hold on, let me. Uh, here, here I, I'm, I'm showing you text on the screen. You're not missing much if you're listening to the audio version of this. Um, the rear camera is keeping a 12 megapixel uh, resolution with a one over 1.7 inch sensor, 1.7 f 1.7 aperture, a 24 millimeter uh, equivalent focal length. So th this is the same main sensor size and resolution as what's in the Xperia 1 Mark II. It's very similar to the main sensor that's on the Galaxy S21. It's the same size sensor that's in the iPhone 12 Pro Max. So it's fine for a Samsung. It's fine for an iPhone. It's fine for the most expensive iPhone. Now, mind you, you don't get that sensor in the $1,000 iPhone 12 Pro. You only get that sensor in the 12 Pro Max. And I guarantee you, there are gonna be people complaining that, well, Sony makes all these camera sensors, they should have put in a 48 megapixel even larger sensor. And they're not going to spell out the comparative differences of phones around 1,000 and phones around 1,100 to $1,200, like the iPhone. And they're only gonna fixate on, but it needed the more megapixels. And I don't think that's what a proper camera focused Sony device is really going to focus on. Um, when, when, when you pick up an Xperia 1 Mark II, immediately you're struck by how scary, spooky fast the autofocus is. And at present, I'm not sure there are any super megapixel sensors that can achieve that kind of uh, DPPDAF performance. And the software on tap, when it locks onto an animal's eye, <laughs> um, you, know, I, 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 you know, I talk about like focus peaking and, and better visual indicators for how you can craft content and make sure that you're locking on what you think. Well, my daughter like runs into frame and you see this thing floating her face and then it goes and it's just on her eye and it's tracking a five-year-old bouncing around my living room, and it is scary accurate. So you keep that all consistent. If your focus is speed, um, accuracy, a better fidelity of image because of the focus performance and the ability to lock focus on moving on moving targets, um, that's where you stay. That That is the correct sensor to use to deliver the, the better camera experience. And so then you just, why have a 12 megapixel this and a 13 megapixel ultra wide and a 16 megapixel zoom? Just make them all 12. So it does look like the telephoto sensor is getting a little bit of a nudge. I do believe that this is larger. I think the telephoto on the Xperia 1 Mark II was a smaller sensor. Someone please correct me if I'm wrong there. But it does have two distinctly different focal lengths, the equivalent of a 70 millimeter and a 105. So we'll have a true optical difference in the performance in the zoom, and then you'll be able to digitally crop a little further than that. Because I really feel like on the OnePlus 9 and the Xperia 1 Mark II, the weak spot has been the telephoto. I really think crop sensors are probably better performers overall. Um, like the sort of the uh, up to around 10 times zoom, what you get out of an S21 easily beats around 10 times zoom on an Xperia 1 Mark II. Like, it's it's pretty clear, it's pretty evident. Um, so having this dual stage, you know, two distinctly different focal lengths that can kind of move back and forth, that that helps, like that that definitely should um, help improve what, uh, what we can do with the telephoto. And then uh, what is the ultra wide? Yeah, same thing. So the ultra wide camera sensor is similar in size to the main camera sensor on a Pixel 5. It's a one over 2.5 inch. 
uh, also 12 megapixels and around a 16 millimeter field of view. So that trio, very well understood, very well uh, um, supported. Um, and then also just, this is where like the bread and butter of Sony's camera software is nailing a, a camera feeling experience. And again, I'm, I'm, I, I was feeling really solid on it with the one Mark II. Everything here looks like it's, it's better than uh, on the one Mark III. <laughs> um hold on <laughs> from zel zel Knight, uh 12 megapixel sony isn't on the same level as a samsung sony sucks <laughs> from clifton thomas i'm glad they haven't gone to a new sensor set every new generation of sensor sets with any phone seems to suffer in the first gen you know this is one of the things like on a on a one plus we're now into the third generation of pixel bending sensors. And I think OnePlus's computational photography game is a lot stronger than people are giving them credit for. Where we were from the OnePlus 7 Pro to the OnePlus 9 Pro, totally different animals. And I don't think the OnePlus 7 Pro was a garbage camera. It was just trickier to use and definitely had more issues with things like uh, shutter lag. I think I think the shots you could get out of it were pretty good. Um, it was just kind of a, the app could kind of get in your way more than you would want it to. I am not having those kinds of issues on a OnePlus 9. And more often than not, I look at similar performance, uh, similar setups, you know, in my test photos and liking so much better what OnePlus is doing with color science, with HDR, with uh, highlight processing. And the raw capabilities are insane. Um, so anyone saying like, oh, you know, OnePlus still falls short is, is really bad at photography. I mean, you've got to be really bad at, com uh, at composing a shot to get poor images out of a OnePlus 9. Um, <laughs> Dave Burns, good luck trying to explain optics to number junkies. Well, but this is why we need to continuously kind of... Uh, you know, push back against those lazy review tactics because what you can do on a Sony is incredible, but it's a very different kind of conversation than trying to convince everyone that all they should care about is a pixel style auto shutter. You know, I, I'm not trying to sell my, my parents on Sony's. It's not the right fit for them. Um, my dad is digging his pixel 4a and my mom is is kind of waffling back and forth. Like she's still totally fine on her OnePlus 6T, um, but she's not sure. Like maybe she'll go OnePlus 9 or maybe she'll go Pixel 4a 5G. It, it's something, anything she can do to one up my dad. You know, like, well, my phone is a little nicer than yours. <laughs> is is hilarious. They're such nerds. I love it. Um, but but she doesn't know. So it, 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 this is an opportunity, and it and it's sad because. You know, they're, they're going to look at this like lowest common estimation of use. And, and we already see it. Like we see it on the OnePlus. Like, oh, well, camera's not good enough because I looked at a pixel peeping review of the software in pre-beta state. You know, it was embargo launch software. And uh, yeah, not good enough. I'll, I'll take the L, OnePlus. And, and, and I feel like Sony is going to get sucked into a very similar kind of conversation. We're not reviewing an Xperia 1 Mark III for what it is. We're reviewing it for what it's not. But then we've decided that it's already a loser. And, and like I said, kicking off this whole section on Sony, how many tech reviewers who were tweeting things like, I bet I could already write my review on this phone without even going hands on. Well, then that means you're really bad at your job. If, if, if that's really what you're able to glean from an announcement and you don't even need to use the phone to write up your stance on what it is going to represent, then you're basically tacitly admitting that you're only crafting content to satisfy the bias of a very particular audience, that you're not really judging these devices on their merit. And we knew, we know that that's kind of what YouTube I uh, sort of instills in creators, but it's rare. <laughs> it's it's it makes me uncomfortable to see people 
Um, so brazenly admitting, you know, again, saying the quiet parts out loud. And this is why like my OnePlus 9 Pro camera review is, is now going on to its fourth day of shooting and editing. Because it also took several days just to shoot all the samples that I need. That's, that's what it takes to review a camera. Uh, if you can't just spend 24-7, 365, you know, shooting content of you using this stuff, it takes time. And if you don't give it time, then you're not really getting a fair assessment of what this thing can do. Um... Oh, yeah, I'm way behind the chat. Hold on, give me, give me just a second to catch up here. Do, 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 do. There was when TK joined... Yeah, from, um, what is this, Mutilaturuk19? I don't know how to say your name, and I'm sorry. Um, the Sony Alpha team who designed the camera on the One Three said that they wanted it to feel consistent with the feel of changing lenses. And it, it, what's funny is that they're going to be in a race against OnePlus. You know, when you are shooting 4K60 video on a OnePlus and you tap to go wide and it just zooms out, it just opens up the frame and you didn't have to stop recording... You know, that is a very uh, subtle and smooth action that I love. And Sony trying to keep their their image science, their color science, post-processing, all of that consistent against three very different sensors is a, is a formidable challenge. Um, from Heike, the autofocus was scary fast on the Xperia 1 Mark 1. Cannot imagine what it can be on a third generation. I'm, see, that's the thing I'm, I'm getting like the most lit up about. There, there's, there's an issue on pixel binning and HDR. Capturing action is not the gig. You, you, you pick up a, a Note 20 Ultra or a Galaxy S21 Ultra. That is not a fast camera. And I feel Samsung gets some some tough criticisms, but then it's still ultimately the phone that they're going to recommend over an Xperia. And if you are someone who's already a little bit more familiar with how cameras work, you've held a DSLR or a mirrorless camera sometime in your life and pushed a shutter button, you will appreciate how phenomenal it is to capture action of a little kid running around, to capture action of a pet bouncing through your living room. That that is a is a tangible consumer perk that is totally gonna get overlooked. <laughs> uh, DTNL. The more I hear about the 2021 flagships, the more excited I get. And Simon says Hypno again. I mean, I think the Pixel is a very good example of this. Uh, Simon says there's something to be said for not radically changing hardware and getting the most out of it. Optimization is a lot more difficult and a lot more valuable than I think techies are willing to extend. Um, I'm not conflicted at all in recommending Pixels to average consumers. That is a a, a peak of beautiful software and hardware optimization. And they're going to dig that camera in the vast majority of the shooting situations that they're, they're, uh, they're, they're likely to engage in. It's the right tool for that job. Um, you know, in fact, in, and in many ways, it bests the performance from larger sensors that kind of need a bit more handholding or get a bit goofier in super bright or high contrast situations. Pixel's got that down. And if you're telling me that average consumers want a casual point and shoot experience and you're sitting there and chuckling to yourself about how pixels just aren't worth it, then you're bad at this. <laughs> you're really bad at it. Um, from Gabaletta, what's frustrating is that I know Sammy can do great autofocus. The problem has always been this race to impress consumers with a different feel every year, switching their camera app software that they have botched it on the still side. I do not like the direction Samsung has traveled with their camera app. And, and I would say like peak Samsung is S8, I mean, yeah, sorry, S7 to S9. I still think the S7 camera app is the best camera app Samsung has ever made. It is simple, it is clean. They don't have that scrolling Rolodex of modes. Your viewfinder is far less interrupted. And the, the autofocus on an S7 is still, I think is still better. The first generation of their DP PDAF 
is is better than what you can get on a Note 20 Ultra. If you care about locking, snapping quick, getting in, getting out, I still think an S7 can outperform some of their newer phones. The 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 hardware on a Note 20 Ultra can deliver much better results in the extremes. Like if you push into really bright conditions or if you push into really low light conditions, that's where the S20 uh, a Note 20 Ultra is going to win. In that middle section, the smaller sensor is probably better <laughs> for a lot of what people think that they care about in terms of photography. Uh, I just missed the, from Du Mur highlighting a message. You could you should consider looking at Fonton camera, which is an open source camera with proper photo processing. And it's a good alternative to something like Gcam for regular shooting. If, if say you dislike how some OEMs have oversaturated colors, I'll check it out. Um, I'm currently using Filmic, First Light, Manual Camera Pro, um, Open Camera, and I'm missing one. There's another, what is the MC24P for video? I can't remember what that app's name is, but I've got a, I've got a short list of about five different camera apps that I, I, I kind of jump in and out of, um, depending on what it is that I'm trying to accomplish. Um, <laughs> um, from a Corcoran three, does the average consumer, can they even tell the difference between the OnePlus photos and the Samsung photos? Um, the sort of short answer to that question is yes, but it's a side by side kind of, kind of experience. Um, you know, like when I was testing the S 21, I was showing my wife, like, look, this is a photo that was taken from the galaxy. And here's a photo that was taken from the OnePlus 9. Um, or, yeah, actually, what I would, what I did most recently is I shot Lex wearing a new dress from both phones. Um, the OnePlus 9, not the 9 Pro. The OnePlus 9 and the S21. And I just told her, you know, which photo. And she liked the photo that had darker shadows because it wasn't as bright in the background. And she's totally been listening to my camera commentary and my podcast. But that was obviously the OnePlus 9. So it wasn't about leading her to one phone. It was saying like, hey, these two, similar conditions. What do you think? So there, there definitely is an emotional or, you know, uh, you can recognize how different phones do different things. In a very sort of Pepsi challenge kind of way, you're, you're going to naturally kind of light up on the phone that gives you the brightest colorful image. And that's what's great for social media. If you're trying to stop someone while they're scrolling through Instagram, that makes a lot of sense. You wanna try and hook them with bright, vivid image. And they go, oh, maybe I'll check that out. You know, our, our primate brains kind of gravitate towards that. Beyond that though, you know, in the Pepsi challenge, if you take just like a little sip of Pepsi and it's way sweeter than a Coca-Cola, you're gonna go, that's it. That's the gig. I, my brain liked that surge, that zing. But if you drink an entire soda, maybe you don't want something that syrupy sweet and you kind of fall back and go like, oh, maybe I want something that's got a bit more kind of a, a different kind of flavor profile to it. And that's how I feel about Samsung's camera. I feel Samsung's camera heavily weights the expectation that this photo is only desirable for getting likes on social media. And if you're more interested in capturing family memories, doing prints, um, I, for my, uh, for our wedding anniversary, I did a photo book of the last year. I, I mean, like this was kind of a big deal. I spent a week putting this book together and most of it is phone photography. Um, but it's a year in quarantine. And, and like, again, I, I wanted to do something special because my wife and I had that conversation where like, we can't remember our wedding anniversary for 2020. There is no photo of it. There is no video of it. We didn't post anything really substantial on social media. That that day is just gone. And so I, I made this photo book and it looks phenomenal, but none of those photos came from Samsung's. <laughs> Lots of LGs, um, uh, a couple of her photos from the Pixel uh, at the uh, later in the year, um, a couple of my photos from the 4A, and the Pixel 5, and then some OnePluses. Like, there's actually quite a few photos from the OnePlus 8 Pro. But yeah, like, it, it, it's never as simple as, well, can they even tell? Well, of course they can, but they're not gonna have the language to dissect, you know? Average consumers care very much about editing. 
but they don't talk about the structure filter and am I using this plugin and what about the saturation? Should I touch up the vibrance? They're using filters. You're using filters to abbreviate all of the granular little sliders, but they are still editing. Look at this explosion on platforms like TikTok. They care very much about video editing. They just don't go about, you know, oh, but Adobe Premiere, you know, like that's not their gig. So average consumers are, are creating content at a much higher level than we give them credit for. <laughs> DT, oh no, Sony still makes phones? You snarky guy, you. Um, but but uh, across the board, I kind of just want to wrap this up a little bit. Oh yeah, we got about 10 minutes. Uh, so I want to wrap this up a little. Uh, the, the rest of what makes the Xperia 1 Mark III a unique option is is why I'm I'm seriously considering that this will probably end up being my my actual work phone, um, not just photography, but higher refresh rate display. That's kind of cool, but I'm really hoping they get after a brighter display. It's been one of the sticky spots on Sony's is it's a little tricky to uh, to see out in bright conditions. I'm always going to be interested in testing. Uh, audio capabilities, stereo speakers, and a headphone jack. Like I, I'm, my my guess is that the DAC will be good, but the amp might be a little weak. That seems to be what happened with my Xperia One Mark II. And then I'm really trying to think. You know, there are some opportunities for mobile broadcast, and I and I want to play a little bit more like we had with the Xperia Pro, plugging in a USB capture card, hooking it up to another camera and taking some of the show more on the road. Because when I had the Xperia Pro, that worked way better than I thought it would. And that kind of immediacy, like not just broadcast from the phone, but then also incorporating a better camera could be pretty incredible. So when we start looking at performance, when we start looking at battery technology, when we start looking at power management, um, when we start looking at making a pocket computer a more robust piece, of of uh, someone's gadget kit, you know their gadget outlay. Um, that 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 makes me a lot more excited than. Well, they're you, they're charging less. I mean, they cut a bunch of stuff out that you like, but it's cheaper now. <laughs> so yeah, I'm expecting the Xperia to be premium and then live up to it because there are no other phones that don't have a hole punch or a notch, that have a headphone jack, that have a respectable amount of built-in storage, 256 gigabytes of built-in storage, and still include a memory card slot to add more. You got to pay for features. Um, I do want to wrap this up just on one quick little story before I bounce and let everyone go catch that NASA thing. When we're talking about cameras, all the misconceptions and how tech reviewers get this stuff wrong so often, it'll be in the show notes, but this is a note from Filmic. It's a note on Filmic Pro version 6.14 where if you rely on the zoom lens as part of your current production, please disable auto updates under iOS settings and do not upgrade to the latest version because they will be removing support for the telephoto lens on iPhones. And why would they do that? It's because there's a whole extra camera on your phone that doesn't get used as often as you think it does. And if you're ever in mixed lighting conditions, low light conditions, the phone kicks you back to the main camera sensor and crops down. That's a part of the iPhone's hardware that Filmic has no control over. And so instead of trying to fight the iPhone, they're just gonna remove support for the telephoto lens. These, these types of things, this type of usage never really gets detailed. We just sort of look at what the phone does and we kind of blindly take some marketing slides as reality and then we never test, we never dig deeper. This is why this stuff matters. The consumer experience, someone using Filmic is gonna blame Filmic. Oh, but I was trying to do something and then it switched up and now I can't have control and I don't have access to these settings. What, what's going on, Filmic? Why is your app broken? And it's not. It's a problem with the iPhone. But the iPhone gets a pass on that because iPhone. And no one ever takes the time to really look at what's going on with the camera, dig any deeper and explain there are compromises you make on every single platform. Samsung gets a pass, iPhones get passes because they do.
So uh, as just the last note to leave you off with, we're gonna hear every complaint about how the Xperia 1 Mark III is too expensive. We've heard every complaint about how a OnePlus 9 Pro is just not good enough. So, so close OnePlus, but better luck next year. And basically any company that's not Samsung or Apple is, base, is in line to be the next whipping boy automatic loser in all of these technology showdowns. They're not reviewing these products for what they are. They're reviewing them for what label is not on the side of the box. So uh, we got to bounce. NASA, go hit that NASA press briefing. G go do it. Um, what, what, what's the link? What's the link again? Mars.nasa.gov. I don't know why I can't remember that. Mars.nasa.gov. We flew a helicopter on another planet and we controlled it from Earth. I need you all to be super lit up about this. I, I, I can't be more excited about this if I tried. Mars.nasa.gov. So folks, thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you so much. Everybody that was that was supporting, I saw more tier one subs. I'm sorry, I, I was kind of jumping in and out of the chat and I, I didn't highlight you all as, as I should have, but you know, and Gary the Fireman giving out a bunch of tier one subs. I, I just, I appreciate it so much. Keeping production rolling on this channel. Uh, supporting content creators that need the help, that need the attention, that need the action so they can keep up with what the work that they're doing too. Not just casually or lazily re uh, relying on Facebook style algorithms, but instead going out of your way to, to say, this person did a good job, check them out. Means the world to any content creator and at any size, but especially someone that's really trying to get a leg up on their audience and, and build something unique for them. Joining these conversations means the world to me. So folks, I want you to have an amazing week. I want you to do awesome with your technology. I want you to be awesome with your technology. And I'll catch you back here next Monday for another episode of the Monday Morning Tech Chat Show on the SGGQA podcast channel. Be well, take care, stay safe out there. We're so close to figuring out the new normal. Now is not the time to be taking dumb risks. So keep your heads down. We're going to get through this together. I love y'all. Take care. I'll catch you back.